You are watching the television premiere of Heart's Delight, the story of William H. Minor here on Mountain Lake PBS. I'm Bill McColgan alongside Jen Kowalczyk of Mountain Lake PBS, and we are so proud to be bringing you this important local story. But remember, this kind of programming, and indeed Mountain Lake PBS in itself, is not possible without your support. We have lots of wonderful ways to say thank you when you make your call, but the important thing is that you choose to make a call. Keep our phone volunteers busy, keep our website active. We need to hear from you tonight so that we know that this is the kind of thing that you value. And it's not just this program. When you make your call in support of Mountain Lake PBS, it's about all of the programs that you appreciate all year round. It's the PBS News Hour, it's Downton Abbey, it's Masterpiece. So many programs that I know that you love and appreciate, and we can't bring them to you without your support. So make a donation in any amount that you can. Any amount will help us. And the average donation that we receive here at the station is $60. So don't underestimate that the difference that you can make. Even if you give $5 per month, it really helps us. It really does. And we have uh, volunteers standing by uh, waiting for your call from the Minor Institute, our friends at the Minor Institute. You can also call the number on your, phone, on your screen. You can uh, visit us online. Um, but we need to hear from you. We really want to hear from you. Um, tell us about what you think of our mission and what we can do uh, to make sure that we become an even more valuable part of your daily lives. That's right, and it's not, and, and, and Mountain Lake PBS really strives to be integrated into our community, not just through local storytelling, but also through community events, through being involved with lots of organizations, through really important partnerships. And again, it's only possible with your help. So make that call right now or go online to mountainlake.org and take advantage of some of the really wonderful thank you gifts. William H. Minor enriched his community by providing funding for crucial projects. Right now, you have the chance to enrich our community as well by becoming a supporter of Mountain Lake PBS and helping us carry on our mission of providing the best educational, informative, and entertaining television available today. When you become a supporter of Mountain Lake PBS, we have some great ways that we'd like to thank you. For a contribution of $75, We'll be happy to thank you with the DVD of the film you're enjoying right now, Heart's Delight, the story of William H. Minor. This double-sided DVD contains the entire 86-minute film, plus the making of Heart's Delight, and over one hour of archival films from the 1920s on Shazy Rural School and the Heart's Delight Farm. When you support Mountain Lake PBS with a contribution of $84, we'll thank you with the DVD of Heart's Delight, and a bonus DVD, A Place Out of Time, The Altona Flat Rock. This 30-minute documentary was produced by Paul Frederick 25 years ago about the unique geological history and ecosystem that exists at the site of William H. Miner's Million Dollar Dam. For your generous contribution of $150, we'll thank you with both DVDs and Dr. Joseph Burke's book, William H. Miner, The Man and the Myth. The book traces the life of the businessman, philanthropist, and visionary of the late 19th and early 20th centuries who proved the American mobility myth true, that success depends not on who you were, but on what you could do. Take a few minutes right now to support the station that brings you the proud history of the North Country and preserves this legacy for future generations. Call the number on your screen or visit mountainlake.org right now. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Tom Halleck with Mountain Lake PBS and we are so happy to have Paul Frederick here with us. Thanks, filmmaker. Sarah. What a wonderful documentary Thank we you. are thoroughly enjoying. We, uh, this was the part we were talking uh, before the last, uh, in the last break about uh, this project, the reservoir that he tried to build. Right. He was so successful building the farm, it was so huge. And when he tried to take on this reservoir, this turned out to be the, the one big project that he, he couldn't conquer. Right, I mean, um, he put in a lot of money and a lot of time, a lot of effort, and I think he just figured sooner or later it was all going to work out. But uh, it did work for about seven years. There's, you know, shots in the show you can see. Full after of water. they poured the cement, after, after they did they all the work and kept going back. Yep. And then I think there was a problem with the generator at the powerhouse, and then they, it was still leaking, and they really wanted to have more power, more electricity. So that's when he uh, started the project up at Shazy Lake, damming that up. That became the reservoir for the dams. So he set his sights on Shazy yeah, Lake yep. instead. Yep. And that worked. That, and that did that work, work, yes. Uh, at, uh, in Altona, the Fine Bird Park, there's um, the McGregor Powerhouse is still there. 
and then it's not working anymore. I think it worked right through to six in, into the 60s. Really? A little further downriver was the LaSalle Power House, and so he kind of put in uh, two in place of one and got even more electricity, so. But the one at Flat Rock, the, the remnants are still there? The remnants are still there, yeah, and it's, uh, it's pretty well still. I mean, he built it to last. It's the, the cement wall is starting to crumble a little bit, but it uh, hasn't fallen over by any stretch. <laughs> Do you think most historians would probably agree uh, that was his one of his few faili failures, but probably his biggest? Yeah, definitely, I think so. Uh, just for the amount of my, uh, money and uh, time he put into it. I, I think it has to be, even though it did work for a little while, I, I don't think it uh, worked out the way he had envisioned it. So I, I would definitely have to say that's probably his biggest blunder. And one of our package deals, uh, the one with the uh, both of the documentaries and the novel, um, you, uh, you're you going back 20 years to your very first documentary. Well, yeah, tw 25 years, I think it was 1990. A was Place Out of Time was the name of the documentary yeah. on Altona Flat Rock. When I came to work here at uh, Mountain Lake right out of college, uh, that was the first documentary I did, so 25, 1990, 25 years ago. So that shows the amazing place <laughs> where the uh, reservoir was built. Yeah, yeah, and there's a lot of other very unique features of the Altona Flat Rock, uh, that it's a very unique geological a location with just like hard rock that was scraped clean by a, a, a flood uh, 10,000 years ago and um, the industries that were there. So it's kind of a expanded section of what we saw for the Altona Flat Rock, I mean the uh, Million Dollar Dam section of this film. And speaking of the Million Dollar Dam, if that was one of his biggest failures, Probably the Shazy Central Rural School was one of his greatest accomplishments. Yeah, I think uh, that along with the hospital, um, definitely those are still going strong to this day. Um, I think he realized that uh, those were areas, that it sort of no longer became about his, him or his farm, it was more about the community. And uh, I mean, 100 and what, 10 years, 100 years for the school, almost 100 for the hospital. They're both still going strong. Uh, that's quite a testament. You had mentioned a few moments ago that you, you thought that when Miner created Heart's Delight Farm and he had all the farmers from the area come in and he was hopeful that he could maybe teach them uh, farming techniques that would help the right, community. Right, yep. He, in later years, then perhaps set his sights on the school as maybe that's where yeah. I can teach a future generation of farmers. Yeah, and, and also, um, wealthy individuals of that era were funding colleges and he was the first to really fund a, an elementary school and a, a primary you know high school so he really wanted to get to youth when they were young and teach them about agricultural practices now he was a, was a little bit of a some arguments there with Mott about um, the curriculum because there was no curriculum for this kind of a school they had to basically come up with it. So George Mott and was who he brought in to run the school and and, and he uh, was almost like a son to Miner. Yeah. The son and, he never uh, had. And, and it's funny because Mott actually approached Miner with the idea so uh, of starting the school. So in a way it's sort of Mott's idea but Miner then in the way he does kind of took it over hmm. as far as the construction and the technology. Mott was in charge of the curriculum um, and went around the country trying to figure out what kind of curriculum are we going to put in this school? And M Miner kept pushing for ag agricultural curriculum. And then there was some, uh, if you get Joe's book, he really <laughs> goes into this very deeply, but uh, there were some arguments with the state about whether agricultural classes would um, meet the requirements of state education. So, but that was his idea was we have to get to the youth and teach them about agricultural and science rather than have them come out to the super farm he had built that no one could really uh, make on their own. So. so this type of school was really novel for the time, not only for New York right. State and the North Country, but really across the across country. Across the country. It, when you look at that part of the video now, you go, oh, you know, that looks like a lot of the schools we see today, but you have to realize almost all the schools in the country were little one-room schoolhouses. So to have a, an auditorium of that size, two swimming pools, you know, an elevator, it was just unheard of. And people would come from around the country and go to Shazy and study that. 
because and it became a model. It became really. a model, yeah. And to get the kids to and from school, really one of the first to bus yep, them to there. Bus them in, yeah. uh, whether it was horse drawn school buses with skis in the winter if necessary, right, right. or uh, yeah. or uh, the the uh, some of the earliest school buses, uh, the, the kids would be picked up and dropped off at home after. Yeah, after real school. real innovation. I mean, it's uh, like I said, you kind of take it for granted when you watch it now, but. You know, on the DVD, Tom, on the second side, you see little film clips of the school in this documentary, but the full 45 minute film that, that those clips are from is on this DVD as a bonus. That's one of the extras. And, yeah, and yeah. There's and almost really great 45 watch. minutes of footage. Now, that's from the late 20s. Where, where yeah. would that footage have come from? Well, uh, again, Miner was uh, a big promoter, so he <laughs> made this film to promote what a rural school trying to sell like, the idea trying to sell the idea to the rest of the country and just a wealth of, of video of yeah, every aspect of stuff. it the, the swimming pools the yep. the giant uh, theater and it was a silent film so there's those little uh, you know um, what are they subtitles, called? subtitles underneath. before each section and it's fun to read it and see the way they worded things and the way they were trying to promote aspects of the school so I, I tell you it, it's fantastic to watch all the way through. and that's one of one of the extras you also have footage from CVPH and uh, some of the farms yeah, uh, some of the farm uh, films are on there too so which for for that era to have that much yeah. film as a documentary maker you must have been in heaven to yeah, have absolutely. that much film that you discovered and it's it's interesting because all the old photos we used uh, those were all taken because Miner would make these really elaborate um, guest books. So, I mean, like leather bound and just with hundreds of pictures. For visitors coming to the for farm. For visitors coming to the farm, he would give them a copy to take home. Amazing. Or send them at the holidays and he'd make calendars. But all those photos were used in that uh, manner. But you know, now it's a great historical document that I can use to do a documentary. And tell a story. Yeah, yeah. Great, thanks Paul. Let's go over to uh, Bill and Jen. Thanks, Tom, and thank you again to Paul Frederick, the very talented filmmaker who is making this uh, outstanding documentary available to all of us uh, watching here on Mountain Lake PBS. We are so thrilled to have been hearing the phones ringing. Uh, we do appreciate your support, and we need your support in order to make sure that Mountain Lake PBS continues its mission here in the North Country. It's, and it's, it's volunteers from the William H. Minor Institute, so it couldn't be more appropriate. Give them a call. They're wonderful to talk to, and they're waiting to hear from you. We can't be Mountain Lake PBS would not be here without your support. So it's so important that you make the decision right now to go from being a passive viewer to an active member and show your support, show that you value everything that Mountain Lake PBS does in this community and the programs that you enjoy all year round. And speaking of the Minor Institute, the man who has been really uh, such a large part of the success of what has become a true gem in our part of the world is standing by now with Paul Larson. Paul is with Dr. Rick Grant, the president of the Minor Institute. Thank you, Bill. As the president of the Minor Institute, mm -hmm. what's enjoyable for you when you watch this documentary? Well, uh, I'm struck. I've seen this three or four times now, and each time I've seen it, I'm struck with the drive that he had as a young man, but also now as, as president of Minor Institute. Uh, so thankful for his foresight, right? And the legacy that he left, not just for us at the Institute, but for the whole North Country, as you've heard throughout the evening, right? Uh, you know, with the hospital and the school, the, the Alice Minor Colonial Collection. Uh, he covered all the bases, really. It's, it's humbling and it's just fantastic to see this. Yeah. yeah, his legacy sure does live on in the North Country. Mm -hmm. What Absolutely. I'm wondering as a viewer is I see this exciting film footage right. of that magnificent farm. Yes. Now, I know that parts of it don't exist anymore, but I'm wondering yeah, what can a tourist view mm -hmm. when they go see that area? Oh, we love to have people come visit. And the core of the buildings are still there. So some of the photography that's in the documentary, the core is still there. The da old dairy barn is still there. Now is our equine center. Um, we encourage people to come. We have an exhibit there that's open from May through October. So people can get more in detailed information on William Miner's history, but also about the present day, I'd say objectives and goals of the Miner Institute. We, we welcome people to come in and take a look around at that, but also the farm as well. Now the farm is the current location of the Minor Institute. That's Absolutely, correct. it's located physically where Hearts Delight Farm was and we like to think still is, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Now what exactly does the Minor Institute do for its community, for the people who don't know? Well, our, our, our mission really is threefold. We have a lot of educational programs. 
Uh, we work with Plattsburgh State in the environmental sciences area, and that's a over 40 year endeavor. We work with University of Vermont uh, dairy science type undergraduates, and then a range of people really nationally and internationally in the summer, uh, working in equine management, uh, dairy farm management, uh, people who are looking at pre-vet or ag research. We do uh, research, a lot of research in those same areas with a particular focus on the dairy cattle nutrition and management side. So that, that in a nutshell, I mean, I could talk for hours about it, but in 30 seconds, that's what it is. So there's an absolute yeah. wealth of information at the Minor Institute. We, we think so. We yeah. like to, to give our audience a wealth of information as well about <coughs> the local mm -hmm. stories, the regional stories. What is your opinion of Mountain Lake PBS for showing mm -hmm. this particular documentary that is telling right. a regional story and informing and entertaining the public? Yeah, well, I guess there's only one right answer, but to me, what people are seeing right now is why Mountain Lake PBS, why PBS in general is so important, right? It's the local stories, it's about people that made a difference, really helped to define what we have today, right, in, in the North Country, in the Champlain Valley. And you don't get that anywhere else. So to me, that's, that's the take home, that's what's so important about PBS. Well, we appreciate hearing that. Now, oh, we, have some, we have some wonderful phone volunteers tonight from the oh, Minor yeah, Institute. Yeah. What can you tell us about our phone volunteers? Well, they're staff, primarily from Minor Institute, but also from the Alice Minor Colonial Collection in Shay Z. So together, we, I'd say we represent at least the Shay Z connection of uh, both William and Alice's legacy here in the North Country. Tell me a little bit more about the Alice Minor Institute. Well, uh, that was created obviously by Alice Minor um, early in the, in the uh, last century uh, after Hearts to Life Farm had been founded. Um, basically, it's, it was her way of, of pulling together her passion with collection with a colonial focus, but other things as well, quite eclectic. And really, I think it's a, it's a nice cultural additive or, or add to the region, right? It, it kind of, it's a nice counterpoise, if you will, to the science and the agriculture, uh, kind of covering all the bases. Yeah, I also yeah. appreciated how, how Miner knew how important mm -hmm. that theater and the arts were when, when he was Oh, developing no his schools and, yeah. and his, his mm -hmm. institute. Well, thank you so much for oh, being in pleasure. our studio yeah. tonight. And now we're gonna go back to Bill and Jen. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And thank you, Dr. Grant, for being here with us tonight. And thank you again to our volunteers from the Minor Institute. So give them a call. You wanna talk to these volunteers. They're wonderful and they wanna hear from you. So right now, give them a call at the number on your screen. And when you do, you can take advantage of the $75 donation level to receive the DVD of Heart's Delight, the program that you're watching to now, which also includes plenty of bonus features and additional material, and of course, all the beautiful photography that we've been seeing tonight. At the $84 level, you can take advantage of the two DVD set, which includes Heart's Delight and A Place Out of Time, the Altona Flat Rock, two wonderful DVDs produced by Mountain, or excuse me, by Paul Frederick. And at the 150 level, you can receive those two DVDs and the book that we saw by Dr. Burke, Dr. William H. Minor, The Man and the Myth. Again, the important thing is that we hear from you right now. Keep our volunteers busy and call the number on your screen. Now we wanna get you right back to the film, but first we're gonna to toss it back to Tom and to filmmaker Paul Frederick to set us up for part four of Heart's Delight, the William H. Minor story. All right, thanks a lot, Bill and Jen. Part four is going to look into the next big part of his life, and that's the first hospital in the region and what a hospital it was. Yeah, again, nothing was uh, small. In he William never did Miner's anything on a small scale, things. did he? This was quite a, uh, there was two small hospitals in Plattsburgh. And, at and the time, yeah. At the time, he was very good friends with uh, Dr. Silver, and together they sort of uh, worked on getting the hospital going. And um, it was quite a, f again, I, th I think it was Charles Mayo from the Mayo Clinic, uh, we talked about it in the beginning of the show, saw it and said it was the most well-equipped hospital in the entire country, so. At the time, I, and that would time. have been 1924 when they started yeah. construction, four million dollars he pumped into that right, project, right. which would have been more than $50 million today to, to create that, yeah. uh, that uh, hospital. all out of his own money, and, and again, he didn't call it the William Minor Hospital, uh, it wasn't about that to him, it was about helping and providing for the community. Did he see a need, did he see a deficiency in, in yeah, healthcare? Yeah, I think, I think he did, and I, I think again, he wanted to make the, the rural areas as um, enticing to the youth to stay here as he could, and certainly, you know, was one of the deficiencies of the country and country life that the cities could provide better. So, uh, you know, providing a school, a hospital, place to work at the farm, it was all part of uh, 
you know, this country life movement. And as we'll see, a part of his legacy that lives on today. Yeah, and I think also coming up in this section, to me, is probably his biggest uh, thing that he contributed was the, f the founding of his foundation. I mean, it's a little hard to, to visualize it and tell that's part of the story, but without that, a lot of those, uh, you know, the hospital and the school might not be there today. I mean, to this day, they're still receiving money from his foundation, which is amazing foresight. We're now returning to Heart's Delight, the story of William H. Minor on Mountain Lake PBS.